Hey guys, Rick here. Okay, just have to make sure, confirm over here on my other computer that we're actually live. Hmm. Here we go. Oh, oh, looks like we're live. All right, hang on while I, yeah, there we go. Cool. All right, guys, welcome. I'm just getting my question sheet set up here so that we are good. Welcome, welcome. So my name is Rick Stone. I'm from Stony Acres Gardening. Uh, glad that everybody is here today. Welcome to our webinar. Let me uh, shrink myself down here so that you guys can see what we're going to be talking about today. So this is the uh, third in our year-round gardening workshop series uh, that uh, we have been doing over the last few weeks. This one today, we're going to talk about growing spinach in the fall and the winter. And uh, we had about 180 people that registered for this event. And uh, we'll have, I'm sure, others that, that show up as kind of we go along. So we'll kind of give it a, a minute here to uh, let people kind of settle in. We're up to about 45 people here right now. Um, so while you're here, say hello. Tell us where you're from, what your weather is like right now, um, maybe what your winters are like, because we are going to be talking about winter gardening a little bit. So uh, let me know what things are like in your area. We have been pretty close to 100 degrees for the last few days. Um, I think we actually hit 100 on Monday, and we've been in the high 90s ever since. So, um, so uh, yeah, <sighs> summer is here, but we're already talking about winter gardening. So I know that sounds funny, but um, hello to everybody. So we've got people from New Jersey. We've got... Um, Wisconsin, Ohio, Colorado. Um, okay, so I'm seeing some a few questions pop up. Mark, I see your question there um, about pill bugs. I'll make sure that AJ uh, checks and gets that in. Um, just so you guys know, we're a little bit hectic today. We actually, today is our, our day to take care of our little grandson. Um, he's about six months old. And so AJ's trying to manage him and uh, taking care of the, the questions. So, um, so yeah, uh, Mark, I'll, I'll make sure that AJ gets that question posted in there so that we know exactly what it is that you're asking. Um, so we'll go from there. Okay. Um, welcome everybody. I think we're, we're up to almost a hundred viewers here. So let me just make sure I always forget to silence my phone. So, um, I'll shut that off. And uh, we're three minutes in, so I think that's plenty of time for people to show up. So let's go ahead and get started. So a couple of maybe business things first. Hang around. We do have a free mini course that um, we are going to be giving away at the end of this course. And there's a link actually down in the description that you can click on uh, to um, check that out. Um, I wanted to make sure that we thank our sponsors for today's Workshop, True Leaf Market and Smart Pots are sponsoring the prizes that we're giving away today. So let me show you the prizes. We'll make me big again. <laughs> we're going to give away a Smart Pot, five gallon Smart Pot this time, and then another one of the Stony Acres Gardening Fall and Winter Seed Collections from True Leaf Market. So we'll have both of those. We'll be giving those away partway through. Um, all right. So just to kind of give you guys a flow as to what is going to be happening. Um, over the next few days, we this is our big year-round gardening time uh, where we really are pushing and talking a lot about year-round gardening. Uh, we've done three workshops, including this one today already. Uh, the first one was, um, what was the first one? <laughs> um, I've totally forgotten what the first one was. Uh, so, it, yeah, hmm. <laughs> totally drew a blank there. Last week, we talked about summer gardening and beating the heat in our summer garden. Today, we're talking about growing spinach. And then next week, we actually have three uh, workshops that we're going to be going through. Um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week, we're going to have workshops. Each of those days, we'll be talking about different year-round gardening topics, including uh, some of the crops that you can grow, timing on when you can plant those, and we'll be talking about protecting your your crops uh, during the winter as well. So those workshops are coming up next week. Those three are coming up next week. Um, this week, uh, today, we're going to be talking about growing spinach in the wintertime. And uh, that is actually, if you really want to have a successful winter garden, spinach is one of those crops that is very important to that uh, winter garden because it's very hardy 
and very productive during the winter months. And so we're going to talk today. I'm going to give you some, some hints on how to plant and when to plant and what to do so that you can plant this fall and possibly have a harvest that lasts as long as six to maybe even eight months. There are a few years where we've had almost eight months worth of harvest uh, from our fall planting of spinach. So we're going to talk about when to plant, how much to plant, when to harvest, and how to protect it. So that's kind of what we're going to go through today. Uh, just a couple of things that you guys ought to be aware of. Uh, there's no cheats. There's no, you know, everything we're going to talk about isn't foolproof. You know, you have a uh, a winter that has minus 25 degrees for three weeks and, and maybe this isn't going to work. But for the most part, for most of us, we should be able to have a pretty good, um, you know, we should be able to have a pretty good go at making sure that we have a, a good harvest of spinach. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of a rundown on what how this is going to flow. So I've got about 15 or 20 minutes worth of, of instruction for you. And then we'll give away the prizes. And um, while I'm doing the actual teaching, it's really hard for me to keep track of what's going on in the feed. So if you guys have questions, my wife AJ is actually upstairs and she's copying and pasting those questions into the, a sheet so that I can then see those a little bit later on uh, when we get to the questions. So we'll do 15 or 20 minutes worth of teaching. We'll do the prize giveaway and then I will answer questions. Um, last week and the week before we went about an hour. I'm actually trying to keep it a little bit less today because over the weekend last week, I really threw out my back really bad and sitting for an hour is going to be really hard for me. I'm okay right now, but I think by the time we hit about 45 minutes, I'm going to be at my limit of sitting because uh, I have been trying to recover from throwing my back out. So uh, we'll see uh, 45 that is kind of what I'm targeting for today is, is to try and hit there. Um, okay, so who am I? For those of you that don't already know me, my name is Rick Stone. I'm the founder of the Gardening Academy. I'm also the principal author on the website, Our Stony Acres. I'm a master gardener, and my wife and I have been gardening for 25. This is the, our 26th garden this year. Uh, one other thing that's important to this topic is we've actually been growing spinach as a fall and winter crop for 14 years now. This season will be our 14th, so we've got 13 under our belt. Uh, next season will be our 14th um, season of growing spinach uh, in the wintertime, okay? All right, so let's get started. Um, we've got 102 people here, and it uh, looks like we've got some good info already going on in the chat, and I've got a few questions here. Um, so we'll kind of move forward and get going, okay? All right, so I love growing spinach in the winter, okay? Spinach for me is a really good crop to grow because it's so versatile. You can use it as a cooked green, which a lot of people, that's what they're used to doing, but it can also be a salad crop. And the nice thing about winter grown spinach is it stays sweet and tender even when the leaves get big. They're, they're sweet and tender. And so even if you have great big leaves on those spinach plants, they're still usable as salad. Uh, ingredients. We Most of the spinach that we harvest throughout the winter, we use in our salads. And uh, the nice thing about spinach is, is, is you can have a spinach salad. You know, there's a lot of greens that you don't really want to have an entire sorrel salad or an entire Swiss chard salad or something like that. But you can actually have an entire uh, spinach salad. And that's nice. And that's one of the, the benefits of, of having uh, spinach growing in your garden during the, the winter time. So we're going to talk today about planting in the right time so that we can get that extended over the winter harvest. We're going to talk about how to protect from pests because pests can be a real problem in the fall, especially. Um, we're going to talk about planting big. We're going to talk about when to harvest. We're going to cover row covers, hoop houses, and cold frames. And I'm actually going to talk about a few other crops that you can do the same thing with. So we're going to teach you spinach but there's actually four or five other crops that you can do the exact same thing and get about the exact same length of harvest out of them. So again, we're shooting for eight months. Some years we get eight months worth of harvest. Um, other years, it's more like seven. It, it really depends on how warm our spring is. So here's the kind of the, the flow. We plant in August. We start harvesting about mid-October and we will harvest all the way through sometimes until mid-May. Um, more often than not, 
it's mid-April. Depends on what the weather's like. This year, we had kind of a cooler spring, and so our spinach lasted longer than it normally does. But some years, we'll have a really warm um, April, and that will, will cause it to bolt a little bit sooner. But we, you know, depending on the year, seven or eight months is what we're getting from that harvest. Now, the warmer your environment is, the shorter that window is going to be. I know that sounds funny, kind of opposite of what you would expect. But if you live in zone eight, you're going to have a, a shorter harvest for spinach just because it's going to get warmer and those plants are going to bolt sooner than they will for me in zone six. Okay. All right. So let's first talk about planting. Um, and Mary, I, I say that I, I say that I don't look at the, the, <laughs> The thing, but I just saw Mary's thing come up. Mary, we're going to talk about what types of spinach to grow towards the end. Okay, so I'm actually going to give you some varieties of, of what to grow. Um, all right, so let's first talk about planting and when we should be planting. And uh, this is one, let me let me make myself go away for a second. Um, this is actually one of our cold frames from a couple of winters ago. And uh, you can see this is a this is all spinach. So we plant it really thick and uh, it grows really, really well. This picture would have been taken probably in February, I'm assuming. You can see another, this is a cold frame of carrots back behind it. Um, but this is this is kind of a look at, at what we are hoping to get to, um, is a good, big, thick, planted um, container of spinach for us, okay? All right, so if we want to have fall and winter harvests of our spinach, then we need to be planting that six to eight weeks before our first frost date, okay? So let's use my garden as the example. My first frost date is normally right about October 1st, um, sometimes October 5th, right in that range, okay? So that means I start planting my spinach for fall and winter harvest on August 1st. Okay, my target is always August 1st. The latest I've ever planted for fall and winter harvest is about August 21st. And it was a little bit smaller harvest that year because we missed those, those early weeks. So eight weeks is kind of your target. You do have a little bit of wiggle room in there uh, to plant if you, if you are wanting to harvest for fall and winter. We need that, that eight weeks before your first frost. Now, if you are less concerned about winter harvest, but you would like to have a really early spring harvest, then you can actually wait until about four weeks before your last frost, I'm sorry, about four weeks before your first frost date uh, to plant. Those plants will, will get up and will just be little small baby plants. Then the cold weather will come in and the, the light will go away and they will stop growing. You can throw a row cover over them or put a hoop house over them, leave them alone, for December, January, and February, you'll open up that cold frame in March and it will be loaded with uh, yummy spinach, okay? So you can overwinter, but it won't, if you plant it four weeks before your first frost date, it won't be ready to harvest in the fall and for most of the winter, okay? So just know that. That's So that's our target planting time. If you want fall and winter harvest, eight weeks before is when you start, okay? All right, pests, let's talk about pests. And again, let me turn myself off here for a second so you can see the picture. Spinach in the fall, especially in the late summer. So here we're talking about, for me, August, the month of August, it's really susceptible to a bunch of different pests. So you've got aphids that can come in, you've got white flies, and for us, one of the biggest problems is leaf miners, okay? And so it is really important that you have a plan in place to, par to protect your plants from those pests. And for me, that is uh, the, using light fabric row covers. So we get the really thin light fabric row covers. So here we're talking about the ones that, that are listed with like 0.7 to 0.9 ounces per, I think it's per square meter is, is how they measure it. Um, those are light fabric row covers. They, we still get plenty of light transmission. The water will get through to them, but the bugs can't, okay? The other solution that you could use is they now have lots of bug nettings that they've started to come out with that we can do the exact same thing. So you could put those on a hoop or you could just throw them directly over the plants, either one, and that will keep all of those pests out. And it's important, especially, you know, in that first six weeks of growth that we keep those pests out so that they're not later uh, being in our nice little warm cold frames and hoop houses and surviving the whole winter. So make sure that you keep those pests out 
by using some type of row cover or some type of pest protection to keep those, those bugs out. And if you do get an infestation, of like aphids, then you need to tackle them. You know, you need to get some, use some neem, you need to use some uh, insecticidal soaps, uh, maybe if you can find them, some ladybugs uh, to deal with uh, that, those pests before we put the cold frames on. Otherwise, they're gonna, they're gonna hang out and be a problem all winter, okay? Um, plant a lot. Uh, this is the next thing. So uh, if you really want a worthwhile harvest of, um, spinach, then, then you need to plan on having quite a bit. You're, you're going to put quite a bit of effort into this and you need to make it worth your while. So I delegate at least one four by eight foot bed to my, uh, to my planting every year. So I will always do that um, at least four by eight foot bed. Some years we'll actually do a four by eight foot and then another four by four foot section of another bed because it grows so well that you plant a lot of it. Um, it's worth it and make it worth your while to, to actually get a lot. So, so make sure that you allocate, you know, some good space to it. Um, of course, if, you know, if it's just you, then maybe a four by eight foot is, is too much. But for us, um, it's, it's basically just my wife, AJ, and I now, we do have one kid still living us, with us, but she doesn't eat spinach. So um, it's just us. And that four, four by eight foot bed actually does a pretty good job of taking care of the two of us for most of the winter, having a good supply. Okay. All right. Harvesting. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and this is where we kind of start looking at the timing of how things are going to run. So if you get those guys planted about eight weeks before your first frost date, um, then you are probably about eight to 10 weeks after that planting is when you are going to start harvesting. So for us, we plant on August 1st, we will start harvesting about October 15th, okay? The perfect thing about that is, is, is the timing just works out really well with spinach because it starts getting ready to harvest just as the last of my summer garden is going away. So, so we've just had a frost and lost our tomatoes and our peppers and our squash and all that kind of stuff. No more zucchini. And so it makes a nice transition from the summer garden, which we're just losing, to the winter garden, which will just start happening. So about 10 weeks after planting is when you're going to start harvesting. For me, we also plant lettuce and kale and lots of other greens as well this time of year. And so I will actually be fairly cautious with my spinach uh, early on. So we'll, we'll pick a few leaves to add into salads and stuff like that, but we don't pick that bed really hard. We want to let the spinach last. Um, and so we'll, we'll actually leave the spinach alone until the lettuce plants, because lettuce isn't as hardy and so it doesn't last as long. So, so, you know, once the lettuce plants die off in early December, then we really start focusing more on that spinach. So the other thing is use those big leaves first. The weather's cool. Those leaves are going to be tender and they're going to be sweet. Um, and we just kind of, you know, we, we just kind of slowly go through the patch and we, we take the biggest leaves and, and understand that spinach is not going to grow anywhere near as quickly in the winter, in the fall and winter as it does in the spring. So you, you, you need to be cautious that you don't over harvest as you're harvesting. Go for those biggest leaves first. Leave the others, they'll slowly grow, but over the winter, you'll see a pretty slow growth rate um, as, as those go. Uh, the dead of winter, so for me, the dead of winter is January and February. Well, the first part of February. Um, that's when harvest is gonna be the slowest. Number one, it's harder to get out because we usually have snow, um, but then January and February, we will we will probably is what is what we end up doing is we'll go out and harvest enough to last us for like a week to ten days. So we have a really big container that we just stuff full of spinach. We wash it and then just stuff that container full of spinach and put it in the fridge. Spinach lasts a long time in the fridge, and so we'll harvest like a week to ten days worth of of leaves during January and February because it's so hard to get out there. You know, because we, we, you know, we have snowstorm after snowstorm and, and, and things like that. Um, then the other thing that you need to anticipate in this whole scenario is those plants are going to go crazy in the spring. 
So towards for us, towards the end of February, they will just start taking off. When the light starts to come back, we start to get longer than 10 hour days again, those plants are just gonna take off and go like crazy. And so you're gonna have another really big rush of spinach in the spring. So you should have a, a nice harvest in the fall, a good trickle harvest all the way through the winter months, and then just a giant harvest in the spring, okay? Now, one other thing that I will mention to you is as you are, um, as you are harvesting during the winter when it's cold and frozen, you, you need to make sure that you choose a sunny day to harvest, okay? So spinach, if you harvest spinach when it's frozen, so let's say it's in a cold frame, but it's still gotten frozen. If you harvest it frozen, it will just turn to mush, okay? But if you leave it on the plant and let the plant thaw out and then harvest it, but it, it's just like normal spinach. It's weird. I, I, I don't understand all the biomechanics of that, but if it thaws on the plant, everything will be okay. If it thaws on your countertop, it'll just turn into mush, okay? So um, just make sure that you go out on a sunny day when the temperatures are above freezing in the cold frame. It might not be above freezing outside, but it probably will be inside the cold frame on a sunny day, and then you can um, harvest on those, those sunny days. So just make sure that you do that, okay? All right, let's talk about protecting your crop. And I'm seeing lots of questions, guys. Thank you for... Um, for posting those and, and AJ is uh, is making sure that we get those. So um, if we, you know, if we get, oh, you know what? I totally forgot to do this. As you guys are asking questions, do AJ a favor, would you? Put like three or four question marks before you ask the question in your comment. Add question mark, you know, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. That makes it easier for her to find them because that you guys are talking back, back and forth and everything. And so, um, that is uh, that makes it a little easier for her, okay? All right, so let's talk about protecting our crops now. So there are three different ways that we can protect our crops easily, okay? We're not gonna talk about greenhouses. If you have a greenhouse, amazing, you'll be able to use that to do this exact same thing. But most of us don't have a greenhouse, and so I wanted to kind of just go simpler. And the first thing that you can use to protect your crops is row covers, okay? So here we are talking about heavy fabric row covers. So when you go to buy one, you're going to be looking for um, row covers. They Again, they, they rate them by ounces per, I think it's per square meter. And you're going to be looking for 1.5 to 2 ounces per, if it's square meter, square foot, I can't remember exactly what it is, but 1.5 or 2.0 is, is the range that you're looking for. That's a heavy fabric row cover. Uh, it'll say frost blanket, it'll say protects, um, Six, or six to eight degrees, that's what we're looking for, okay, is a heavy fabric row cover. These guys last forever. I have, we started doing this 14 years ago. I still have the original row covers that we bought 14 years ago, the heavy stuff. Light fabric row cover doesn't last nearly as long, but the heavy stuff does last a long time. So um, buy some good heavy stuff and it's gonna last and, and do a really good job, okay? So if you live in zone eight or above, Fabric row cover is all you're going to need, okay, to protect your crop. You're just going to go out and throw that over your crops uh, when it gets really cold and leave it on during those cold seasons, and uh, that should be all you need in zone eight. Zone seven might be enough. A, fa a fabric row cover might be enough, um, but you might want to consider a hoop house or something like that. If you live in zones three through six, like I do, I'm in zone six, then you are, you are going to need something above and beyond row cover if you want your harvest to last all the way through the winter, okay? Um, so fabric row cover won't be enough protection to make to take you all the way through the winter. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that might, okay? So this is a hoop house. Let me, I'm gonna turn myself off so that you guys can see this. This is one of our many hoop houses that we have done over the years. And it's just a simple structure um, we're going to talk more about these next week and some of the workshops next week, but it's just a simple structure of some uh, PVC pipes bent into hoops with a little ridge pole, and then we just simply throw some painter's plastic over the top, use a few clamps to clamp it onto the raised bed. You can do the same thing um, 
in uh, you know in your out in your garden as well. If you want, you could you could do that. But instead, you're you're going to probably use some like rebar. Put some rebar in the ground first, and then put those hoops over the top of the rebar. And uh, a hoop house is a really really good uh, way to keep a spinach crop protected. Okay, so zone eight, a hoop house is nice to have, but you don't have to have a hoop house to winter garden in zone eight. Okay, you should be able to get away with just fabric row cover. If you would like to build a hoop house. That's amazing. That will do. It will do really well. Zone seven, a hoop house is probably all you're going to need for um, winter gardening. Uh, but but a hoop in zone seven, it will be a hoop house in combination with a fabric row cover. Okay, because there will be times in zone seven where you have a, you know a real cold string in the teens and lower, and you'll want to throw inside your hoop house, you'll want to throw some fabric grow cover over the top for some added protection. But usually in zone sevens, most of the people that I've taught over the years have been able to just get away with a hoop house, okay? Zone six, it might be okay for some crops. A hoop house is great for like kale and totsoy and mosh. Um, spinach is not quite as hardy as those. And so I've, I've honestly, I've never tried it in a hoop house. Um, it might be all right, but I've always wanted to use a cold frame for mine. In zones three, four, and five, a hoop house is, is probably not going to be enough um, for, for you. You're probably going to want to to graduate up to a cold frame um, because a hoop house just doesn't quite offer as much protection as a cold frame. Okay. All right. So let's look at the cold frames, which is our last option. This is a couple of our cold frames. They're, they're sitting side by side. Basically, a cold frame is some type of box with a clear glass or plexiglass lid, okay? So ours are actually made out of wood. Um, we've got, we've got a, a, a one by, or I'm sorry, it's a two by 12 at the front and a two by eight at the back. I'm sorry, opposite, <laughs> two by 12 at the back and a, and a two by eight at the front so that it angles towards the sun and then we built some plexiglass lids that go on top. And you can see that's what the snow is sitting on in this picture. Um, cold frames are kind of the Cadillac of, of protection, of winter protection, especially if you build one out of wood or possibly out of brick or something like that, if you want it to be more permanent in your garden. Um, those are going to do a really good job because they keep the, the wind and the draft out. The wood gives a good insulating quality to it. The glass, um, either glass or plexiglass will be a better insulator than the plastic on a, on a hoop house. And so cold frames do a really, really, really good job. And they are amazing for zones three through six. Um, we have three, three cold frames that we use for our smaller crops, spinach, lettuce, mosh, um, carrots, turnips, things like that. Um, we grow in the cold frames. And then for the taller crops like Swiss chard, totsoy, kale, we use the, the hoop houses, okay? Um, in the, the dead of winter, even in a cold frame, you are going to want to have some fabric row cover as well. So in January and early February, when we have our really low temperatures, like last year, our low last year was about zero. We got right down to zero last year. Um, that's Fahrenheit, by the way. Uh, so during that time, I actually take some fabric row cover and throw it down inside the cold frame as well to give some extra added protection, okay? So if you use one of these combinations of plants, or of um, protection, you ought to be able to have um, some of these hardier crops survive the entire winter, okay? Uh, and uh, even as low as zone three, and I know some people in zone three don't believe that, but your biggest struggle in, in like zones three and zone four is snow. Um, and, and so um, some people will deal with snow by, by having a, like a high hoop and then putting the cold frames inside the high hoop so that you can still get access to them. That's the, the biggest struggle you're going to have in, in some of those really cold zones is a lot of snow. Um, and so that, that snow will actually insulate and protect your crops but it also makes it really hard for you guys to get into them. So, um, but even, you know, things like spinach, kale, Swiss chard, totsoy, and mosh will grow through the winter, even in zones three, okay? So uh, you, you, you can, again, if you can get to it, you, you can grow these crops in the wintertime. So 
uh, these are the other crops that I that I mentioned that that you could do exactly the same way as spinach. So kale, kale is actually super super hardy. Um, for people in zone um, seven eight, you probably don't even need to protect kale. Okay, in zone six, I will usually throw a hoop house or a fabric row cover over it, but um, it, it's super super hardy. Swiss chard the same way. It's it's hardy. It may even be a little bit more hardy than spinach. Tot soy, which is a um, Asian green, um, is uh, very, very hardy, just as hardy or hardier than spinach. And then mosh, which is sometimes called corn salad, uh, is a little bit different than all of those. It's a little bit more lettuce like, but um, very, very hardy, grows really well. Even through the wintertime, it will continue to put on growth. And uh, that is another great crop. So all five of those, spinach, kale, Swiss chard, tot soy, and mosh, are all crops that you can do this to all the way through the winter, okay? And, and again, we're gonna be looking at the same planting times. So we would plant about eight weeks before our first frost with all of these crops. The exception to that is mosh. Mosh actually is a little bit quicker growing and it also likes cooler temperatures. And so with mosh, I would wait until about four weeks before your first frost to plant it because it's gonna have a hard time germinating in the hot of the summer. It needs to get some cooler temperatures. Okay. All right. So that is uh, some leafy greens for us for the uh, winter time. So hopefully you guys found that uh, interesting. Um, Gloria, I, I see this. So AJ, you can, you can skip this one. Um, what about collards? Collards are not quite as um, hardy as kale and, and plants like that. And they're also bigger and taller. You can definitely do collards in the fall, but those are going to be one of the things that I am going to harvest earlier than some of the others because they're they're not going to be as hardy as spinach and kale. And then they're they're usually bigger, so they're harder to protect. You've got to have them in a hoop house or something like that. So collards is a, a good fall crop, but not as good to go all the way through the winter. Okay. All right. Um, one thing that I wanted to do is take a drink and then um I wanted to remind you guys of our year-round gardening mini course. So this is a free mini course that we are offering. Uh, that is, there's a link in the description of this video that you can click on to get access to that. It's about 45 minutes. Goes through all of the, the, the protection things that we just talked about with a little more detail. And it's a, a fun little mini course. So if you haven't already signed up for that, click on the link below to sign up for that. Um, I, I also have some other resources. So let me turn this off really quick for you. Um, other resources, the, the Year Round Gardening mini course, uh, seed starting ebook. There's a link for that down below um, because you can use seed starting to, to do a lot of this. If, if you don't have space out in your garden, you can do it. Um, you know, you can do it in uh, indoors and then transplant that out later. Um, so a couple of seed starting resources for you. And then, of course, our fall and winter seed collection, which is right here. And uh, you can, that has 14, this has 14 seeds, including my favorite spinach, my favorite kale, um, it has mosh, it has tot soy. Um, so all of the things that I talked about here are part of this collection, along with some root crops as well. Okay. All right. Um, really quick, let me just tell you about the year round gardening master course. This is actually coming up. Um, it will, it opens up on, on Monday. So we will start selling this course on Monday. This is our master course. It has about five and a half hours worth of instruction. We do a weekly study guide. We, we do Q&A sessions every week for the first four weeks after you guys have bought the course. It has a private Facebook group. We're actually in the process of refilming this course right now. And so over the next six months, you will see a totally refreshed course, which the one you buy will be, you, you'll get the refreshed course. We're also doing a workbook for it as well. So there will be a workbook that's that's added. And this course will be open for sale starting on Monday, July 10th um, through the 17th. And so we'll have more information for that next week um, as we kind of go through and do our stuff. Okay. All right. Let's talk about our prize winners. So um, here we go. So as what I did, we had 180 people that actually registered for the prize contest. And so I put your names into a spreadsheet and then did a run, random number generator and it spit out the following two winners. Okay, so let me turn myself off so we can see. The Smart Pot was won by Jimmy F and the Seed Collection was run, run won by Jennifer S. Okay, so congratulations to both of those. 
and I will contact you. So I will send you out an email later this afternoon to get your mailing address. So you don't need to bother contacting me. I will contact you. That kind of helps me to make sure that we're talking to the right person. Um, so I've got your email address and we'll get those off. So congratulations to both of you for being winners. Everybody's a winner, but well, yeah. Um, again, this is the seed collection and this is a really fun collection. Um, True Leaf Market is the one that actually sells these. We don't sell them on our website, but um, it's the Stony Acres uh, collection and you can see it's got our logo. It's even got my picture on it and it has 14 different seeds. We've got um, all, it's 10 of them are leafy greens. So, you know, Swiss chard, two or three different types of lettuces, spinach, et cetera, et cetera. And then it also has root crops. So it's got beets, it's got carrots, it's got turnips, and it's got radishes. So this collection, it's only $17 for 14 packages of seeds. So, and these are standard sized True Leaf Market seeds packages. So there's a link in the description if you guys wanna go buy one of these. Um, it's pretty cool. I was pretty thrilled when they asked me to do it. So it's kind of fun. Um, okay, so let's do some questions. Oh, one thing that I wanted to, we had this question come up last time. So I wanted to make sure that I mentioned what varieties of spinach I like to use for uh, this, this uh, growing. And um, there are two varieties that we have tried that have been really successful. Um, one is a hybrid, which I'm not a huge fan of hybrids. And so I, I actually don't grow this one anymore. Um, but if, if you're okay with hybrids and you can find this one, it's called Melody. And uh, that one did really well for us. The first five years that we grew spinach, um, we used that Melody version. And then the other one that we love right now is called Bloomsdale Longstanding. Okay, and that is, uh, has done really well. It has nice sized leaves, good tender. It sweetens up really well with the frost. And um, so that is a great one. So those are the two varieties that we use, okay? All right, so let's look at questions. Um, let me see, try and make this a little bit bigger. All right, so Mark, last time I asked a question about pill-sized bugs devastating my garden, but you mistook them for a pill bug um, and I didn't follow up in time. Um, came to find out, uh, it, came to find out they were Asian garden beetles, okay? So um, those Asian garden, I'm assuming then, Mark, that they, they kind of look like a ladybug. Um, usually Asian beetles are, are a little bit different. Um, and, and again, there's a ton of different varieties. Japanese beetle uh, doesn't look like a ladybug, but there's an Asian beetle that kind of does. Um, organic solutions for those are going to be things like neem, um, diatomaceous earth, and exclusion. So using netting um, or light fabric row covers to keep those out, that, that are going to be your, your organic solutions. So those are the things that I would recommend. Um, if you are not uh, organic, then there are probably several. You need to identify, you need to make sure that you identify exactly what bug it is. And then there are, there are several sprays that you could use um, to, to uh, to take care of that problem. I, again, I, I'm an organic gardener, so I, I don't have any recommendations on brands or things like that. You just need to read the label carefully and make sure that it is rated for the pest that you're trying to take care of, okay? All right, um, hopefully that helps, Mark. And I apologize last time that we, we didn't. Um, more like a tiny June bug, okay. Um, so it's probably not the Asian bug that I'm thinking of, um, the Asian beetle. Um, it's probably something a little bit different. One thing, Mark, that I might recommend to you is um, see if you can catch one and um, take it into your local extension agency. So, so even in the big cities, there ought to be an extension agency somewhere close by where you could take that in and get it identified. And that is, that is going to help because um, we don't want to just start randomly spraying things or, you know, until we know what it is that we're actually getting after. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Angie. Um, does spinach survive frost? Yes. So spinach will definitely survive frost. Uh, you, I, I actually don't put my cold frames out until after my first frost. Uh, I, I don't worry about spinach until temperatures really start getting into the high 20s Fahrenheit. So Celsius, that's going to be minus five-ish or so, um, maybe minus three. 
that's when I really start worrying about my spinach. So a little bit of light frost on spinach is actually going to sweeten it up and make it taste better, and, and it will be fine. Okay, Most of our cool season greens, even lettuce, will survive a light frost. Okay, So yeah, you should be fine there. And then what are the best plants to grow together with spinach? Some garden nurseries call it companion planting. Um, I'm not a big follower of companion planting. Um, a lot of that is just... There's, there's not a lot of science backing to it. Um, so the things that I have found that have grown well with spinach have been Swiss chard. Um, those are both in the same family. Spinach and Swiss chard are both in the same family. Um, the, we have grown uh, spinach with carrots before. So half a, half a cold frame of carrots, half a cold frame of spinach. Spinach has grown well with all of the other leafy greens. Lettuce, uh, it's done well with lettuce. We've done it with kale and tot soy even bok choy, all of those. So pretty much all of those leafy greens should do pretty well together. You don't, there, there's no, with the companion planting, we're, we're more worried about things that don't grow well together and, and those are all just gonna be fine together. So, so I wouldn't stress too much about that. Um, plant by transplant or by seeds. Okay, so we plant by seeds. Um, so we direct seed on August 1st in our garden. And that means we have to baby them a little bit. We have to really try and take care of them. But um, we, we try to direct seed. Spinach isn't a huge fan of transplanting. Um, it's because it has a long tap root, it doesn't transplant as well as some other plants do. That's not to say that it won't, um, but, but I, I have always just direct seeded because it does really well that way. So as long as you get it planted, and then for the first couple of weeks, you really have to watch it. So, so you need to water and, um, you know, daily we're watering every day, just surface water to keep that, that, that seed bed moist. And once they get up, then you just kind of have to baby them. Once they're up, then you're going to put either the light fabric grow cover or a bug netting over, which will actually kind of bring the temperature down and help them even more. So, um, but they should do pretty well. Okay. Um, Angie. I'm guessing in zone five, Northwest Indi Indiana, does zone determine frost date or when to harvest and what zone am I, okay? Um, you'll have to look up what zone you're in um, and you're doing container gardening. Okay, so uh, Angie is, is saying that, that hers is containers. So frost date is not determined by zone, okay? Frost date is determined by your region and where you live. Uh, zone it, Zones are actually your your average low temperature, okay? So like us in zone 6B, our average maximum low temperature is about zero, okay? And, and so in you, for you in zone five, your maximum low temperature is probably gonna be like negative 10. I, I don't have the chart in front of me to know for sure. That's what zones are. And zones, there's some correlation with frost date, but, but not really, you know, me in 6B, my first frost date is October 1st, but I know people in zone five and even zone four whose last fr or first frost date is, is October 15th or October 25th, later than mine. Um, so it, it's it's different, you know, the zone, zones, there, there's some correlation, but not enough to, to really say that, you know, I live in zone six and my, my frost date is on October 1st and you live in zone six, your frost date might be November 1st. So uh, it, it's not really that determined. And if you're doing it in containers, you're, you're going to have a harder time making it all the way through the winter. So your goal planting in containers is going to be season extension. So you can you could plant spinach and it, it's probably not in a container. It's probably not going to survive the winter because containers are up off the off the ground. They're more exposed. They freeze harder and faster. And so it's a little bit harder to grow all the way through the winter in a container, but that doesn't mean that you can't grow into the fall, you know, so, so you may still be able to be harvesting, you know, in mid December uh, out of that pot. And it, it won't be until the really cold temperatures settle in, in, you know, mid December, January, and February, when you'll, you'll lose those, but in containers, it's going to be a little bit harder through the winter. Um, you're better off planting in ground or in a raised bed but uh, you'll still be able to extend your growing season. Um, I planted Malabar spinach, but it's not growing very well. Does it like cold better? No, Little Country Kitchen asked that. Malabar spinach is actually a warm weather crop. So 
I'm not sure why it wouldn't be growing well this time of year. Uh, Malabar spinach is actually frost sensitive. It'll, it'll get killed. Malabar and New Zealand spinach, they're not really spinach. Um, and they're, they're a warm season crop. So now is the time to grow them. They, they, they don't like cool weather. Okay. Um, elevated beds. What type of row covers should you use? Um, this is uh, Gloria Bell is asking that. Um, so I, you know, if you've got raised beds, you know, you, you could use all three of the options. You could use the, the heavy fabric row covers. You could definitely put like we do, you could put a hoop house. Hoop houses are really easy to put on raised beds because you can bend those pipes and just stick them in the ground and the, the sides of the bed keep keep the, the them contained. So you don't have to build any other kind of structure for it. Uh, but you could also do cold frames on top as well. Um, you, you, I will say that I have found that um, some of the more sensitive crops like lettuces, um, the root crops and stuff don't do quite as well in raised beds as they do in the ground in the wintertime. So we reserve our raised beds for some of the more hardy things like kale and Swiss chard and tot soy and mosh. Those go in our raised beds. Some of the, the little bit more sensitive ones go in ground because they seem to do better in the ground because I think there's a little less air exposure there. Okay. Um, let's see, Sherry, when do I cover the hoop house? So I cover, I put my hoop houses out um, when I start seeing frost. So for me, usually about the, somewhere between the first to the middle of October, I, I kind of look though and see, because if it's just gonna be a light frost, all of these crops that we talked about today are going to survive a light frost. They'll actually be improved by them. The taste will get better and stuff. So if it's like one night or maybe even two nights of a fairly light frost, so we're just looking at maybe 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius, I, I may just throw a fabric row cover over them if it looks like the weather is gonna get warm again. So the, the early in the season, the thing that you have to kind of manage is, do we, is, is it worth it to put the cover the hoop if we're going to have to constantly be going out and uncovering and covering and uncovering and covering because, you know, we're having a cold spell right now, but then it's going to go back up to 75 degrees for the next two weeks, then that's a pain in the neck. So I kind of just manage in the early fall, I kind of just manage sometimes I'll throw a fabric row cover over when it's going to be frosty and then wait to put those hoop houses out until a little bit more established cold weather comes, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, What, uh, let's see, here we go. What are the best plants to grow with spinach? Um, okay, we already, we already got that one. Um, can a row cover be green? Um, I've never seen a green fabric row cover. Uh, the, the concern you have is, is those fabric row covers are actually designed to still allow some light through. The thicker they are, obviously, the less light they, they let through. The light fabric row covers let about 90 to 95% of the sunlight through. The heavy fabric row covers are more like 50 to 55%. Um, so I would worry that a green one would cut down the amount of light. We still want light to get through as much as we possibly can um, so, that, so that those plants will continue to get the light that they need. So I, I, I would worry that a green fabric grow cover would block too much sun, okay? Um, do I have a link to a fabric grow cover that I purchase? Uh, so there's two or three different brands that you could look at. Um, you know, anything that you get from most of the nurseries, most, most of the more reputable nurseries. So, you know, like Johnny Seed sells them, um, Gardner Supply sells them. Those are all going to be good quality. If you are shopping on Amazon, um, you've got to be a little bit careful. I bought some light fabric row cover last year. And I honestly, I didn't look at the brand. I just bought it and it literally lasted about two weeks and then it just disintegrated. Okay. So the brand that I like if you're buying on Amazon is called Agribond. And uh, they, that one seems to last and seems to do a good job. Um, but I don't, beyond that, I don't really have a favorite brand. Um, just as, as long as you're, don't, if you've got two options, they're the same, the, you know, the, like they're the same weight and one's $10 and one's $15, buy the $15 one because it's probably better quality. So that, that kind of would be my thing. Um, all right, so uh, AJ's just telling me I've been going more than 45 minutes. Uh, my back is starting to kill me. So we're gonna, we're gonna hold the questions with what we have. So we've, we've got, um, I've got about six more questions that we're gonna answer. 
and then um, we're going to call that quits because my back is screaming at me right now. So um, let's go ahead. We'll answer the ones that are here. So um, Jay Bryson's uh, will be the last question that we answer. Okay. So sorry um, to cut us short, but um, yeah, my back's starting to scream at me. And AJ just reminded me of that. And then my back screamed at me even more. So, um, okay, here we go. Alan and Bunny say, uh, since August is so hot, should you cover the beds with shade cloth until the days cool down? That's a great idea. Um, depends on what you're growing. One thing that, that will help is the fabric row cover. So the light fabric row cover will kind of act as a shade cloth. Uh, we started having about six or eight years ago, we started having real problems with leaf miners in our spinach and Swiss chard and beets, okay? And um, so we started covering our beds as soon as the as soon as we started to see seedlings emerge, we covered those beds with the light fabric row cover, okay? Either on a hoop or sometimes we'll just put some, some stakes up to keep them up so that it's not, we don't want it beating in the wind, we don't want it pounding on our plants, so it needs to be supported a little bit. But we started doing that and since then, our, our crops have really thrived. Um, they, that I think the shade and the added protection in August uh, of a fabric row cover uh, really helps. So putting a fabric row cover on, putting a bug screen netting on is gonna accomplish the same thing as your shade cloth. And that way you can use your shade cloth on your tomatoes and your peppers and things that, that kind of need that late afternoon shade. So, um, you know, if you've got the light fabric row cover, you're gonna need some anyways. So um, you could just use that instead. Um, so Gloria is saying she uses large whiskey barrels. What can I do to cover those? So again, Gloria, with containers, those freeze faster. Um, the big barrels will freeze slower than some other containers for sure, but they are going to freeze fa faster and you're going to have a harder time making it all the way through the winter, depending on where you live. You know, if you were in zone seven or above, I would say you're probably okay and you'll probably be able to make it through the winter. But for me, any containers, anything I plant in containers eventually gives out um, because we just, there's too much freezing. So um, I would say in that case, I would probably just get some fabric row cover. Um, so some of the heavy fabric row cover, you could throw it right over the tops of those barrels and um, you could even cut it to shape. You know, you're obviously going to want some overlap, but you could do some creative things and cut those pieces up and, and use that. But that, that would probably, I probably wouldn't because of the limitations of containers, I probably wouldn't bother with a hoop house or a, a cold frame that fit over containers. Um, and instead I would just use some fabric row cover. You'll be amazed at how much that will help. Um, fabric row covers can extend four weeks or more um, of, uh, on your harvest. So I, I think that that would probably be good. Um, Angie's saying, would Swiss chard be a good to plant with spinach? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, Swiss chard is a great companion with spinach. They're in the same family, and so they don't mind being together at all. Swiss chard, spinach, beets, and I think turnips are all in the same family, and they're 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 not going to mind uh, being together. And you could, you know, you you'd be able to protect them all from with one fabric row cover as well to keep some of those pests out. Okay. Um, Gloria, we already answered about collards. Um, my stevia won't germinate. Suggestions. Stevia is really, really hard to get germinated. Um, we grew it, I've only grown it once, and we grew it, it's been about four years ago, and, and I probably went through, you know, the, the package of seeds was pretty expensive, and I think I went through most of them before I finally got a couple of plants to germinate. Um, I would recommend, uh, you know, covering, so, so I, I would maybe move indoors, to try and get them to germinate. So instead of trying to germinate them outside, I would maybe move indoors, um, put them in a container, cover that container with a little plastic wrap, moisten it down, cover that container with plastic wraps to keep that humidity in. And, uh, and hopefully the cooler conditions of indoors will help you to get those to germinate. But stevia is hard to germinate. We, we, it took us a while to get those to, to, to grow. Um, Will there be a warm crop seed offering? I don't know. I haven't, we haven't brought that up yet. So I, I think it'll depend on how many people buy this one. So I know we, we've already sold about 40 or 50 of them, um, but I think they are hoping to sell thousands. So we'll see how it goes, whether they'll have a warm season crop offering. I'm not that big of a YouTuber yet, so we'll, we'll have to see, okay? Gretchen says, can you, you give us planting time tables for the seed collection? 
Um, so all of the seeds in this seed collection, with the exception of mosh, okay? So, so this, has, this has mosh in it. All of the seeds, you're going to start planting eight weeks before your first frost. Okay, two exceptions, okay? So 12 of the seeds you're going to plant starting eight weeks before your first frost date. The two exceptions are mosh. You want to wait until about four weeks before your first frost and radishes. Radishes don't like the heat and, and they're so quick growing. You can hold those off until about four weeks before your first frost date. Everything else, six to eight weeks before your first frost date is when you're going to plant. That's pretty much the rule for winter gardening, okay? Um, Mr. Rick, I'm having a cicada issue. What do you do? Um, so I don't have cicadas. <laughs> we don't have cicadas in Utah. Uh, other than way far south down in southern Utah. Um, and so I, I'm sorry, I, I don't really have an answer for you on that. Um, I know that people can, will sometimes use exclusion methods, which, you know, again, would be like a fabric grow cover or a bug guard. But beyond that, I, I don't really, I'm sorry, um, I, I really don't have uh, any solutions for you because we don't have cicadas here at all. Um, all right. And then Jim Bryson says, I have three foot raised beds. Will that affect, uh, be affected? as a, a container growers. Um, okay, so raised beds have more volume, more overall so soil volume than a container does. So you will still do well in those beds, okay? Uh, but I will say that raised beds will not, you, you won't be quite as successful in a raised bed as you would directly in the garden, okay? So you want to, kind of select what you're going to plant in those raised beds. So go for the hardy stuff, spinach, kale, Swiss chard, mosh, tot soy. Um, those are all going to make it through the winter, even in a raised bed, okay? Um, carrots will, turnips probably as well. Um, so, so put those in your raised beds and maybe group it. So, so you could plant one bed that is more tender plants, lettuces and things like that. And then you can, um, I just lost my questions. Uh, then you can uh, have some hardy ones, more hardy ones in a different bed. Um, and that, that way you kind of have a mix and, and you would harvest first from the, the least tender ones. The, you know, you're gonna harvest the lettuce, you're gonna harvest the beets, you're gonna harvest the radishes and things like that first. And then you will move on to the uh, more hardy crops later on. So um, it's not, you know, I, I don't want to discourage people that have raised beds because I have lots of my students that have done really, really well with winter gardening and raised beds. It's just not quite as easy because they are, even though they, they have a lot more volume, they are elevated. And so they freeze a little faster. They do thaw a little faster too, though. So, so in the spring, they thaw faster, but it's just a bit harder to do, but not impossible in raised beds by any stretch. You know, I, I've got a, a student that um, that took the course last year that lives in, I want to say Pennsylvania, and uh, he's like zone six. And he did really, really well all winter. He posted pictures all winter um, in the, the in our Facebook group and uh, did really well all in raised beds. So you can definitely do well in raised beds. Just maybe select um, some of the hardier crops to, to plant, okay? All right, that, my friends, is, we're gonna call it because my back is absolutely screaming at me right now. So a um, couple of things to remind you of. Don't forget to sign up for the year-round gardening mini course. That is down in the description. There's a link down in the description of this video uh, that you can click on to do that. And then next week, um, let me make myself disappear so you guys can see these dates. So next week is our big year-round gardening master course promotion, and we are going to be doing several workshops, okay, next week. So on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week, um, July 11th, 12th, and 13th, all of them at 1.30 p.m., we are going to be doing um, more garden extension, uh, season extension videos. Um, these will all be workshops, same kind of format as we did here. We're going to cover... Um, base crops that you can grow during um, the fall and winter on the first one. The second one, we're going to talk more about timing and when to plant. And then the third one, we're going to go pretty intensively over um, row, row covers, hoop houses, and 
cold frames and talk about those. So all in preparation for our master course, which the master course is on sale starting Monday. And so if you guys are on my email list, you'll get an email about that. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll start selling that uh, on Monday. So, but if you come to next week's workshops, um, we're actually going to have a little bit of a special, a little bit of a savings, a free course and a little bit of money off. So come to those workshops next week and uh, you'll, you'll be able to get a little bit of a special deal on that master course. Okay. All right. Thank you guys. This was a good turnout. We had a good crowd and everybody stuck around. Um, I saw up until just the last minute or so, we, we had over a hundred people here. So thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And we will talk to you guys on Tuesday. Happy gardening. See you later.